How many of you ready to kill some giants in January? Say amen. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, the series that we're doing is, is the story of David. So um, I'm going to give you a little head start. We're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 16 and 17 for the whole month. So if you want to put a ribbon there, then you can look really spiritual next week. If you sit next to somebody that doesn't know where we're at, you'll be like, I was here. I know where it's at. So you can do that uh, for next week. Um, you know, I was going to share these last Sunday night when we had our uh, communion service here at Real Life Church, but uh, people don't really realize the scope of the influence that we have here at Real Life Church and some of the people that pass through our doors. And you guys know that week in, week out, we ask you guys to fill out these connection cards and how important they are to us and how vital they are to us as a church so that we can pray for you. It's not that we put you on some mailing list that we sell out or anything like that. It's really so that we as a staff can pray for the needs that come up in your world. And, and I just want to share some of these, you know, because like I said, I don't like to brag, but we've had some pretty impressive folks come through the doors in 2014. Um, uh, Forrest Gump was here. Um, his email is bubbagump at gmail.com in Greenbow, Alabama. Um, how he heard about Real Life Church was his mama. And uh, his prayer request, obviously, of course, is that Jenny will love him. Um, Ricky, Ricky Bobby came one week at shakeandbake at gmail.com. Yep. And uh, this is my favorite next step. Um, my dad used to say, if you're not first, you're last. Is that true? I need spiritual guidance on this. Um, he would like to be on the racing team. Bigfoot, a.k.a. Sasquatch, showed up one Sunday. Um, his email, he wrote, what's that? His address is The Woods in North America. In case any of you were wondering, he is here in North America. Um, he does want to settle down, maybe get married, have baby Bigfoots, find a church home. His prayer request, I need you all to listen closely to this because some of you all need this. There are a lot of misunderstandings about me. And I hope that people stop spreading rumors, like the beef jerky commercials, okay? <laughs> and what I love about this is it's all, oddly, the same handwriting. <laughs> so we have an idea of who we think this might be, but one week it was Sacagawea. She does not have an email. Um, she is in Salmon, Idaho, and uh, she heard about us through smoke signals, um, <laughs> Her prayer request is that she can't find her friends, Lewis and Clark. She heard that they were here. Um, this one from Christmas, Mrs. Claus. Um, at, it's cold up here at yahoo.com. Um, she heard about Real Life Church from the naughty list. What, what? That's us. Uh, her next step is to move south. And I love this. In February, we're doing a series called You and Me on relationships. And her prayer request, we may bring this back up in... Uh, in February, it says her prayer request is her husband. He's a workaholic. He eats too much. He never spends any time with me. He's always with the elves. So pray for me. So um, whoever is blessing us, you are causing us great joy. Whoever. That doesn't mean tomorrow I want 75 Ricky Bobbies. All right? We got one. I just wanted to share kind of what happens on our weekend, week, or week to week basis here at Real Life Church. Uh, some of the fun stuff it, that does happen. We are kicking off a series called Sticks and Stones. Now, how many of you have ever made a New Year's resolution? Say amen. amen. How many of you have kept it? All right. In the first service, we only had four that said that they had ever kept it. Um, and so it's really not likely going into a new year that we would actually keep a resolution. Somebody, we have, we have a bunch of physical trainers that attend church here at Real Life Church. And I think it's because of the physical fitness of the pastor that uh, <laughs> that's not the case at all. Um, but they come to the church here, and I, I, I sat there, and I thought, you know, it would be so fun to go and watch, to be there January 1st and watch the people that are like, yeah, I got it. I'm, this is the year. It's going to be all tight. It's going to look good. I got it. And then just watch as the weeks progress and get to about Valentine's Day. In February, which is only six weeks away, just ask Walmart, they'll tell you. Um, and watch the progression of what changes from that anticipation and excitement of, I got this, I got this, I got this, to, uh, you know, it's Thursday, and you can't really start working out on Thursday, you got to start on a Monday, but then the Monday is like the ninth, and that's a weird day to start out on, right? You got to start on the first, it's got to be the first, so I'll wait till next 
month, maybe March 1st, as long as it's on a Monday, then I can start working out. Um, and and but the progression changes. Something happens when we get all excited about it. We, we, we're, we're so pumped about reaching this level. And I just want to tell you, I don't know what 2014 was for you as an individual, but here's what I pray for you in 2015, is that God's best would be yours, whatever that means. I don't know what that means for you. I'm praying through what it means for me. But individually, in your life and in your home, I pray God's best be yours. And I know some of you are like, well, Vince, I, that's nice. But seriously, nothing good ever happens to me. It's just uh, last year sucked, and this year's probably going to suck. And let me just tell you right now, if that's you, go back to bed. <laughs> Quit whining, okay? Because the reality is some of the stuff that happened this last year well, it's probably your fault. Yeah, thank you. I was, <laughs> was hoping for something, uh, an amen or something right there. <laughs> Nobody amens, it's my fault. <laughs> you know. But that's the reality of it. And so to get to a different place this year, I want to tell you some things. And, and over the next several weeks, we're going to tackle David and Goliath. And the fact that this guy who really wasn't prepared to slay a giant, and if I just ruin the story of David and Goliath for you, spoiler, he dies, okay? Uh, that's what happens. But that's, that's common. But he wasn't built for that. He, he, he wasn't, you wouldn't have looked at David and went, <laughs> giant slayer right there, he's the man. That's not what you would have done. So something in him took him from where he was to where God envisioned him being. And we're going to walk through that in the month of January through Sticks and Stones. We're going to kill some giants. I pray they're big ones in your life. I pray that there is stuff that you've been wrestling with that God puts under your feet this month, and you are able to walk forward and go, you know what, me and God, we got this. The Bible tells us in Philippians that I can do all things. Say that, say all things. All things through Jesus Christ who gives me strength. And so we're going to tackle that today. So if you have your Bible, you can turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 16. I want to talk a little bit first. Typically what I do is I give you the point and then I give you the verse. Well, we're going to flip that and we're going to talk some about the scripture text first. And then we're going to, I'm going to give you four affirmations. I'm not giving you the secret to your success today. I'm not going to tell you how to make all your resolutions come true. I don't have that answer. Okay, because like I said, my prayer is that God's best be yours. And so your answer may be really different. For you, it may be to lose 20 pounds. For somebody else, it may be to find that special someone who might be sitting in the building with you right now. I just wanted to make a moment awkward there for you. <laughs> um, but we don't know. It's different for everybody. But that's my prayer, is that God's best would be yours. And so let's tackle this. Let's dive in and see what the Word of God has to say. Chapter 16, verse 1. Now the Lord said to Samuel, you have mourned long enough for Saul. I have rejected him as king of Israel. So fill your flask with olive oil and go to Bethlehem. Find a man named Jesse who lives there, for I have selected one of his sons to be my king. And we're going to stop right there, and I'm going to unpack that for a little bit. If you don't know the Old Testament history, Israel, God's chosen people, got fed up with their system and said, we want a king. God said, you don't want a king. He said, we want a king. God said, no, seriously, you don't want a king. God, we want a king. God said, okay, you want a king? Pick him. And they picked Saul. Now, Saul was a stud. I mean, this guy, head and shoulders above everybody else. He looked the part. He was a great fighter. He was a good king as far as kings go. But the problem was that Saul was crazy. He was nuts. All right? Now, if you don't believe me, go ahead and you keep reading. Chapter 16, 17, and just read the rest of Samuel. You will see Saul loses it. Well, he had got kind of wrapped up in this king position and his arrogance in this role and the authority that he had, and he began to look at other directions other than the direction God wanted him to go. So God says, look, I've rejected him as King Samuel. Here's the deal. I know he still sits in the seat, but he's not my guy anymore. So you've mourned about him long enough. It's time to find the replacement. Well, then verse 2 jumps in here, and Samuel says this in verse 2. But Samuel said, how can I do that? Because if Saul hears about it, he's going to have me killed. And the Lord replied, take a heifer with you. <laughs> Wouldn't that be awesome if that fixed all the problems? <laughs> I had a horrible day at work. <laughs> what are you doing? The Bible said take a heifer with me, so I'm here. And, you know, what I want to tell you, sorry, I have ADD, and that just kind of took me in a different direction. What I want to tell you is that that God already had a plan 
for Samuel. And see, in your life, you may not know which way it's going to go this year. You may not quite understand what God has in store. And it may make no sense to you whatsoever. It may sound as ridiculous as take a heifer with you. But if you will trust that God's plan is better than your plan, you're going to end up walking into something that will be amazing. And I can just tell you that from experience. I know it because I've walked through it. I've seen it happen in my own life. Now, I haven't taken a heifer anywhere, but I've moved my family not knowing what tomorrow might hold. And you know what? What I find in tomorrow is that God has already been there. And so I'm okay. I'm all right. He says, take a heifer with you, and then what you're going to do is when you get there, you're going to say that you have come to make a sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show which one of his sons to anoint In verse 1, the word is selected. Go get Jesse and his sons in Bethlehem, and I will show you who I have selected as king. In this verse we just read, God says this. He says, when you get his sons there, I will show you which one to anoint. And I want to talk to you today about this phrase, anointing, to be anointed by God. It is to be singled out by God with favor and responsibilities. I want you to understand this and make sure you're hearing me this morning. It is not favors. Because too many times that's what we want from God. We want, we want God to show up and give us some favors. God, can you do me a favor? Can you get me out of this? Can you help me through that? Oh, Lord Jesus, help me. And it's all that kind of stuff. We're asking favors of God, not favor from God. There's a difference. The word favor means to have their hand upon. In other words, God is walking with us. See, favors is different. That would be like, God, help me out. Thanks, we're tight. And then you're out, okay? And you're just doing your own thing. And favor, though, it's, it's, there's got to be a relationship. You gotta, he's walking hand in hand with you. He's got his hand on his back. And you guys know this. If you've got kids or you've seen maybe a coach or something like that that's got somebody and they're down in the dirt with him saying, this is what you got to do. Now, I got you. I believe in you. You're going to make it. You're going to get through it. But you're going to have to let me walk with you until you understand it. That's what the favor of God is. So please don't sit there and think this Christianity, this walk that you have with Jesus is going to be something where, well, I'm, I'm a Christian now, God. I'm just going to let you handle everything. That ain't how it works. Samuel went into a really awkward position here. He was a prophet of God. When the prophet showed up, not all the time was it good. So he's about to show up and say, oh, by the way, I'm about to anoint a new king, which, by the way, is really going to tick off the the, the current king. That wasn't a comfortable situation. If God was only a God of favors, he'd have made the heifer talk and not Samuel. But he didn't. Samuel had the responsibility. Samuel had the favor of God on him. So don't get the two mixed up this year as you're going through life and you're going through this year hoping and praying for the good stuff that God wants to bring to your life. Don't sit there and get in the trap of going, Lord, you didn't help me out of this and Lord, you didn't help me out of that. And God, why did that cop stop me? Or Lord, why can't I get this thing figured out? Lord, if you just help me lose the 10 pounds and he's going, if you just do some sit-ups. There's a difference between favor and favors. Make sure you hear that. Here's the thing about the anointing as we go, and we not only understand that we're singled out by God, but this favor, the anointing is something really specific. And let me give you this. It is the powerful presence of God that equips you, enables you, and empowers you to do the thing that God has called you to do. You can't do it without the anointing in your life. You say, well, this is starting to sound a little weird. No, understand what I'm saying. This is Old Testament, where we're at right now, Samuel, the prophets. God had a prophet. He had a prophet in every region. Sometimes it was Nehemiah. He had Samuel, and Elijah, Elisha, Obadiah, Zephaniah, Zechariah, some of those guys from those, those little books in the, in the Old Testament. They were prophets of God. And what would happen is that God would give them a message And God would speak through them, those messengers, and they would go into cities and regions, and they would give a word. And when they gave the word, it was either good or it was bad. But they would give this word, and they would say, hey, this is the deal. This is what's going on. But in the New Testament, we don't have that. We have something different. And the prophets in the Old Testament would offer the anointing. That's why Samuel showed up with this horn full of oil. He would pour it all over the person he was anointing, and they would be anointed by God. In the New Testament, we have this fellow that shows up, pretty important guy. His name is Jesus. His last name is not Christ. 
Okay? His last, er, that, that word Christ means the anointed one. And so in the New Testament, we have this relationship that happens where Jesus doesn't come on us. He lives in us. So we don't have the anointing on us anymore. We have the anointing that lives within us through Jesus Christ. So you say, well, who am I then? I'm, Vince, I, I'm not anything. No, no, no. Here's the deal. If you're a child of God, you are anointed to accomplish that thing that he has called you to do. And you've got to own it. You've got to believe it. So I want you to look at the person next to you and say, I'm anointed. No, 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 no. You got to get churchy, okay? I want you to preach this a little bit, all right? Right there in your seat, let her rip. Look at the person on the other side of you and say, I'm anointed. One, two, three. That's a little better. Now, here's the thing you can say it, you can scream it however you want, but if you don't believe it, if you don't trust that God means it when he says it, just air you blew out your mouth okay here's what happens when we do this we believe that we're anointed and here's the thing that i understand the reason i had you say it is because you know what there are times you don't believe a word i say up here now you may love me i appreciate that um you may think the world of me but there are things i know you don't believe what i say because they don't get applied. And so the reason I made you say it <laughs> is I may not believe what somebody else says, but I always believe what I tell myself. Some of you understand what I'm talking about because you've even be believed the negative junk you've told yourself. I'll never be enough. I'll always be this way. I just can't get beyond this. I'll never find a spouse. They, I lost the good one. The, the good one got away. I'm pretty sure God makes more than one good one. <laughs> He's a good one. He's a good God. He makes good stuff. It's kind of how it works. But some of you have started believing the negative stuff you tell yourself. That's why I wanted to start off by letting you know today, and you telling yourself, I am anointed. And that's the first affirmation is this. I am anointed to accomplish my assignment. God has given you, Jeremiah tells us that there's a plan and a purpose for you, specifically for you. Is there one for real life church? You betcha. Is there one for me as a pastor? You betcha. But there's also one for me as a husband and a dad and a man of God. And it's specific to me. You don't get to do mine. I'm anointed to do mine. You're anointed to do yours. But here's the deal. You've got to believe that you are. You've got to believe that what the Word of God says is true. And if the Bible tells us in Philippians that I can do all things through Jesus Christ who gives me strength, I'm going to take him at his word that I can do all things. And if I believe that I can do all things and I know that God can equip me to do all things, then you know what stands in my way of accomplishing it? Nothing. Nothing stands in my way to accomplish what God would have me to do. Now, here's the problem, though. To be anointed, you've got to be close to the source. In the Old Testament, you had to be close to the oil. You couldn't be like on the other side of the village and be anointed. You had to be right under the horn so it would pour out on you. Now, when they poured it out on you, you didn't go scrub it off. You just left it on. So David shows up, and we're going to get there in a second. They anoint him with oil, and there he is, greasy for the rest of the day because they poured this oil on him. In the New Testament, it's important that you and I stay close to the source of our anointing. On your, how many iPhone people do we have in the house? Go ahead and raise your hand if you have an iPhone. Well, the rest of you need to repent, okay? I'm, I'm just kidding. Um, on an iPhone, there's a thing called AirDrop. And what AirDrop is, is if you're close enough to someone else that has an iPhone, then I can give you things that are in my phone. I can send you music. I can send you my contact information. I can, I, it's really kind of a cool deal. They have it on their phones, their computers, about anything that Apple does, they put this option on. Well, the reality is, it doesn't work if I'm not close i got to be close enough to receive it. The Bible tells us that Jesus says, if you draw nigh unto me, I'll draw nigh unto you. In other words, the closer I get to God, the closer he's going to come to me because he's going to see that willing heart, and he'll be able to download what's in him into me. And that's the anointing of God, is more of God, less of me. And the more I take that challenge, the more I say, God, you know what? I want more of you in me. 
I'm going to be closer to you. It's not just about reading your Bible, and that's a huge, huge part of it, because if you don't know him, you can't get close to him. So read the Word of God. But it's not just about that. It's about living in this day-to-day life, knowing that he's in control. Not knowing that you have to do it all right, because let's just be honest, none of us are going to do it all right. I mean, somebody invented bell-bottoms. What? (laughs) We're not going to do it all right. We're not going to make the right decision every day. Some days we're going to mess it up. But God says, you know what? The reality is if you'll trust that I'm in control, then I got you. So I am anointed to accomplish my assignment. If you're not writing this stuff down, it'll be your loss. Okay? Because there's going to come a day when you're sitting there and you're staring at the mirror and you're going to a job interview and you don't think you're going to be able to cut it and you need to remember this line. God says that I'm anointed to accomplish what he asked me to do. If this job doesn't work out, then this ain't the job. There's another one coming because God has an assignment for me and I'm anointed to accomplish it. Write this stuff down. It'll do you great come August or June or the moment you don't realize is coming. How many of you had a surprise in 2014? Yeah. Guess what? There's more coming. There's more coming. That's just the reality of it. Let's keep reading. Verse 4 says, So Samuel did as the Lord instructed. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town came trembling to meet him. They said, What's wrong? Do you come in peace? He said, Yes, I come in peace. I have a heifer. No, he didn't say that. He said, I come to have sacrifice with the Lord. Purify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. Then Samuel performed the purification rite for Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice too. When they arrived, Samuel took one, of, one look at Eliab and thought, surely this is the Lord's anointed. I love that the exclamation point is there. Y'all ever pick the wrong one? Say amen. Leave it to a woman to be really vocal in that one right there. Uh Uh-huh, yeah, I'll preach with you now, Vince. Man, we pick the wrong one sometimes, don't we? Wrong job, wrong person, wrong timing. And we get in trouble. Samuel jumped all over. He's like, that's the man. Look at that guy. Big, the oldest means he's a leader. That's the one we want. God said, <clears throat> nope. It's not him. And some of you need to hear this part because some of you sweat this stuff. And it says this, but the Lord said to Samuel, don't judge by his appearance or height for I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Hey, Listen your goal is to get healthy this year, get healthy. But don't get healthy so people notice you. It's the wrong reason. It's the wrong reason. Because you know what? You'll end up still feeling alone and shallow. That's the reality of it. Well, if, if, if I just do this, now hold on, back up. If it's about your appearance, and guys, we live in that culture, all you got to do is go on Instagram and and look, because people will be freaking out about how many likes they have or don't have on a picture. They don't, not enough people like it. I can't believe we got that many likes. You know what? Here's the reality. If your world revolves around the fact that somebody you don't know likes or doesn't like your picture, you need to know Jesus more because he loves you in the morning when you're ugly. He loved you in the gutter. When you didn't know him, he loved you when the needle was in you and you didn't care about him. He loved you in the midst of the affair and he loved you through it. It's not about this. God's trying to set a precedent here for Samuel to go, whoa, 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 back up, back up. You're going to miss it. You're going to miss it. And so Samuel goes ahead and, and goes on. Then Jesse told his son Abinadab to step forward and walk in front of Samuel. Can, can you imagine how awkward this was for the sons? Jesse going, you go. Do I strut? Do I, what do I do? <laughs> do I swagger a little bit? Do I, how do I, what do you want me, Dad, what do you want me to do? Just walk, just walk in front of the prophet. What is he, I don't know what he's here for. He just brought a heifer. <laughs> so 
so they walk through Abinadab, and Eliab, or Eliab shows up, and then he continues on. This is not the one the Lord has chosen. Next, Jesse summoned Shimea, and Samuel said, neither is this the one the Lord has chosen. In the same way, all seven of Jesse's sons were presented to Samuel. But Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen any one of these. Can you imagine Samuel? God, you told me to come to Jesse's house to get his boys. Here's his boys. Now you're telling me it ain't any of them. And I love the next line. Is this all you got? Are these all of them? Really? Please tell me there's somebody else. Imagine the boys in the room when, I mean, your oldest through seven are standing there all proud, making their dad proud. The prophets called for them. Sorry, fellas, it ain't you. You got anyone else? Jesse said, um, yeah, yeah, they're still the youngest. Think about how insignificant David was in this story. He didn't even get invited to the party. He's watching sheep and goats. There is still the youngest, but he's out in the field watching sheep and goats. Samuel said, send for him at once. We will, and I love this. We will not sit down or eat until he gets here. And let me tell you this. Maybe this morning you're having a hard time believing what God thinks about you. You may think you're an afterthought, but God wants you to have a standing ovation when you get to the party. And that's just exactly what happened. David was an afterthought. He's out in the sheep field, but God says, no, 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 we're not going to sit down until he gets here. We're going to stand up because when he comes in, watch what happens. Now, Samuel doesn't know yet that David's going to be the one. He just knows he's supposed to pick a kid. I'm just supposed to pick one of the sons, and I don't know which one it is yet, but please bring me all of them. So Jesse sent for him, and he was dark and handsome with beautiful eyes, and the Lord said, this is the one. Anoint him. Anoint him. Here's affirmation number two. Some of you need to hear this. Just because you're not visible does not mean you're not valuable. But Vince, I I don't do anything big. I, I don't... I don't preach or sing. Let me tell you something. Right now, there is somebody that pushes a button when I step on those stairs so that you can hear me out of this wire attached to my head. And there's somebody that gets here and sets that so that that person can push the button. And then there's another person that sits one seat down from them that makes sure that what's up on that screen is matching what I'm saying to you so that we don't look foolish. And then there's somebody next to them that makes sure that when these lights come on so that when the video camera, who's ran by somebody else, so that people in Alaska who love real life church watch us. And all of that is different people that, guess what? You don't see them. I promise you, you ask the person in Ketchikan, Alaska, or in Chile, which is just wild to me because I don't speak Spanish. <laughs> Portuguese, my bad. They watch us in Spain, too. (laughs) But I promise that person in the back room back there is valuable to them. You say, but Vince, it's not about church. It's about in my home. I'm just, I mean, I'm a mom. That's what I do. I just, I'm at home with the kids. And I, and yeah, you have no idea the value that you have there if you're doubting it. Yeah, well, I just, you know, it's just a small job. It's not much. David didn't even get invited to the party. And God had a plan for him. See, here's the thing that I know and that I understand about things with valuable things is that you and I, we hide valuable stuff. We, we hide it. If it's valuable, we hide it. You don't believe me? Halloween's coming. Yeah, buddy. Halloween's coming. Parents, you know what I'm talking about, right? You take the candy and you go, we need to go through this to make sure it's all safe. Here's that sugar-free candy bar for you. Here's the full-size Hershey bar for me. We take the valuable stuff, and we hide it. We put it away. Some of you right now, some of you ladies, you don't wear all your jewelry all the time. That would be weird. But when it's the night, and it's the guy, and it's all going to go good, and you're gonna, it's a date, and he asks you out, you're going to put the good stuff on. You're going to bring the valuable stuff out 
when the time is right. That's just how we work. We hide stuff that's valuable. Let me tell you right now, you guys, I, I've seen people at the church, they go, well, Vince, I just haven't found my niche. I just haven't found where I plugged in yet. I don't even know where I fit. Let me encourage you. Just because you don't know yet doesn't mean you've been forgotten. It may be because God is hiding you for a time and a place and a purpose that when he reveals you, the whole world will know you showed up. That's what happened with David. God went and forgot him out in the sheep field. He was hiding him for a specific moment. He put him on the shelf going, wait, 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 wait. No, 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 you're not ready yet. But when you come out, it's going to be big, David. There's going to be a giant story that people are going to talk about that don't even go to church. There's going to be this kingdom that rises up as you as the king. But right now, you're going to be in the sheep field, and nobody's going to even invite you to the party. Some of you right now, you need to understand, it's not that you haven't been invited to the party yet. God's just waiting to give you a standing ovation. He's just waiting to show you something that you haven't yet experienced. He may be preparing you right now in the sheep field, and we'll talk about that next week. He may be preparing you right now for something greater than you could ever imagine. And you've got to believe that. Just because I'm not visible doesn't mean I'm not valuable. Third affirmation, I want to keep reading you. So David stood there among his brothers, and Samuel took the flask of oil he had brought and anointed David with the oil. And the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David from that day forward. Then Samuel returned to Ramah. And I'm going to jump down to verse 19. Verse 19. So Saul sent messengers to Jesse to say, send me your son David, the shepherd. That phrase, the shepherd there, when you look that up and study that out, it literally means the one with the sheep. I know. Some deep revelation there for you, huh? You know what it tells me? Is that after the party, you know what David did? He didn't strut into Jerusalem on a throne. There wasn't camels and palm branches and people bowing. He went back to work. He went back to the sheep field. And here's the thing I want you to understand. And this is the third affirmation, and you need to grasp this. Hang on to this. Affirmation number three is this. I don't need a better assignment to experience a better anointing. Say, I don't get it. Some of you need to quit saying, if I only did this. If I only had that. If I, if I only had, man, if I had that guy as a husband, he's awesome. Will you look at him? He's a winner. And I got this guy. Yeah, you got that guy. You don't have that guy. You got your guy. And you know what? You chose your guy. So cut it out. I know, comforting, right? Nobody chose him for you. Well, if he'd just be different. If you wanted him different, why'd you choose the one you got? Well, he's changed. Just him? Or both? If I had, man, Vince, if I was preaching, man, if I was preaching, then I would tell people about Jesus and it would be awesome. Well, let's just back up. Are you telling anybody about Jesus now? Because that's a really good place to start. You don't need a greater assignment. You don't need a bigger stage, a better platform. What you need is to trust the anointing in the place you are right now. David walked back to the sheep field, greasy from the anointing of God, dripping off his hair, tending sheep and goats. I got this. It's what I do. I'm just doing what I do. What do you do, David? I watch sheep. I make sure nothing gets in there. And I didn't realize it, and maybe you haven't realized it yet, but that God taught David everything he needed in the field so that he would be fit for the fight later on in his life. Some of you right now, you may not realize that what God is teaching you in the moment. You don't need a greater experience. You don't need a greater place. You don't need a bigger stage. You need to trust the anointing that God has given you right where you are and believe it for something. Trust that God has a plan for you where you are. You say, Vince, I'm in a bad place right now. You know, if I only had more money, well, you'd probably spend it like you do the money you got now. Well, if I had, my, man, if my kid, you know, when my kids get a little older, they'll be a lot easier to handle. <laughs> Any teenage parents in the house say amen? Yeah. No, no, seriously, Vince, they'll, they'll be easier to manage then. No, listen, listen, if you're making poor parenting decisions now when they're this big, you'll probably make them when they're that big. And the 
unless you fix it, unless you trust the anointing, unless you decide right now in this moment, in this position, in this place, I'm going to be who God has, I'm going to do what I do. Here's a perfect example, guys. Six years ago, God anointed me to do something. He anointed me to start Real Life Church. You know what? That hasn't changed. My position hasn't changed. The calling hasn't changed. The anointing hasn't changed. You know what God has anointed me to do? Today, he's anointed me to pastor Real Life Church. Has everything around it changed? Has the location changed? Yeah, but that's up to God, not up to me. If I'm faithful doing what he's called me to do right now, I don't have to worry about tomorrow. I don't have to worry about being a better husband next month if I'm a good husband today. And tomorrow when I get there. And the next day when I get there. I don't have to worry about being a better parent when my kids grow up. See, I don't don't need a different assignment. I need to trust my anointing. That God's given me kids to be a parent over. He's anointed me to do that. Do I do it right all the time? No. And sometimes I drop the ball. Sometimes I fail. Sometimes I fail as a husband and a parent in the same decision. Doesn't change the anointing. It just means that I have to trust God more for it in the situation. You don't need a different place. You don't need a different person. You don't need a different circumstance. You need to trust God right where you are right where you are. I love the way Eric said it in his prayer there as he closed. Did you catch it? God loves us where we are. Regardless of the junk, the stuff that's back here, because we all got stuff. Yeah, some may be more colorful than others, but we all got stuff. And God loves us in spite of it all. The scars, the bruises, the brokenness, he loves us. That leads me to the last affirmation, and I want you to grasp this. If you don't write anything else down, write this down. I have nothing to prove and only one to please. You say, Vince, I got tons of stuff to prove. You don't know. I, I mean, I, I was an addict for years, and and nobody believes that I'm clean now. And they, they always, well, you know who that is. And you know what? Let me just be straight with you guys. The world is that place. They're not going to forget. I wish they would. I, I do. My heart breaks for people that have been defined by a moment in their life. Because I get it. You get defined by a moment. And that's what everything else is around you from that point on. And, and it was a moment. It was a snapshot. That's not you. That's not what God built you as. It was a moment. But the world won't let it go. The world has a hard time forgiving, much less forgetting. But David is our example. We look at David, and David, man, he messed up. He had somebody murdered, had an adulterous affair with the guy's wife that he had murdered. If you didn't know, those are big ones. But yet, he kept coming back. To what he knew God called him to be. King. King. David, you, I know I need you king. I know I need you king and I love you. See, the problem that we have, guys, is that we keep trying out for a part we already got. If I, if I just do better, if I, I mean, if I just do better as a Christian, I'll read more, I'll study more, I'll pray more, I'll sing louder if I have to, I'll show up early, and we're trying out, trying to please God, trying to make him happy, and God's going, I love you. Well, I love you. Cut it out. There's nothing you could bring me. It's going to change how much I love you. There's nothing you could say that's going to help me to think that I could love you more. I love you more than anything. I'm for you. I got your back. I'm running with you. When you fall down, I'm the guy screaming in your ear, get up. You don't have to stay down. You can win this fight because I love you. That's the God that we serve. You don't have to prove anything to him. You have to say yes to him. And see, I grew up in that world. I understand. That, man, as long as, I, as I, I did this and I did this and I did this and I did this, it was all good. And I, and I could prove to God that, that I loved him. 
never had any effect on how much he loved me. Because he loved me regardless. We have volunteers here at the church that they come and they serve. And if I call them as the pastor, they'll do about anything I ask them to do because it's me calling them. Hey, can you help us out this Sunday? Sure, yeah, you bet. We'd love to help out. Then I hang up and they're like, I didn't really want to do that, but pastor made his call. What am I, can't say no to the pastor. Let me just free you up. You can't disappoint him. I love you. He thinks you don't know me. I don't have to. I love you. But Vince, I failed and I keep slipping and keep stumbling. I don't know. But I love you, so there's not really anything you can do that can change that. Vince, you don't know I've done some pretty bad stuff. Yeah, but I, I serve a pretty awesome God. He kind of specializes in pretty bad stuff. And like I said at the beginning, I want it now more for you than ever before. I want God's best for you. And God's best has always been his son, Jesus. So this morning, I want you to bow with me. No one looking around. Just me and you. Zade plays. Maybe this morning, you, you just realize you've been trying out for a part that God has freely given you. Just do better. I just make all the if I just if I don't mess up, God will be happy with me. God loves you. Maybe this morning you it's time you return the favor. And you've come and you say, God, I love you. Jesus, thank you for dying for my sin. Forgive me for where I failed you. Come into my heart. Teach me to be more like you. I don't want no one looking around. I'm going to pray. And I'm going to give you opportunity today. Today. We've got altars up here at the front. They're on the sides of the stage. I don't want you to miss this. I, I don't want you to miss the opportunity in this moment right now. This, this moment where God is crying out saying, I love you. I'm for you. I got your back. I'll pick you up when you fall. I, I want the best for you. You don't have to prove anything anymore. I just love you. Would you come home? I know you don't think you were invited to the party, but I got a seat at the table for you if you'll just come. I know you don't think you're worth it, but you are worth everything. Would you just step out of your seat? There's no one looking. Just step out of your seat and come pray if that's you this morning. Maybe it's time. Maybe you waited all last year and, and now it's time. You're going to start things off right. You're going to listen to the voice of God speak into your heart. And you're going to let him speak into your heart. Slip out of your seat. People will get out of the way. Come on down. There's some coming. Some of you need to. Don't wait. Don't wait. Don't sit there and, and hope it might. Well, maybe, maybe, maybe I, you know, maybe this will go away. Maybe it won't feel like this later. Come on. Come on. Step out of your seat. You and God get stuff straight today. Don't go into this year wondering if it's right. Go into this year knowing that God chose you and God anointed you to accomplish everything that you need to accomplish. You, not the person next to you you. God has a plan specifically for you, and he wants you to live in it. Come on. Come on. Married couples, maybe it's time. You grab that hand. You settle down together, and you say, we're going to make this work. We're going to fight through it. We may not understand it. We may not have a clue what we're doing, but we're going to put God at the front of it, and we're going to make it work. Today, we accomplish what we're anointed to accomplish as a family. Come on. Come on. 
people down here praying, you won't be alone. Maybe this morning you're here. That's a little much to come down. It's a little much. But you'd raise your hand and you'd just tell me, you'd say, Vince, I don't know Jesus. I I don't know that I'm anointed, but I want to be. I want God's plan for my life. I want to follow it. Would you just lift your hand and put it right back down? I just want to pray for you. I see you. I don't don't know God's plan, but but I want to know it. Come on, just lift it up. It's right back down. I see you. I see you. Hands everywhere. Say this with me. Say this prayer with me. Those of you who just raised your hand, and maybe you didn't raise your hand, but you know that's what you need in your life. Would you say this in your heart? Say, dear Jesus, forgive me of my sin. Help me to follow you. Show me how to live my life anointed. In Jesus' name, amen. Still no one looking around. People down here praying, be mindful of that. If you said that in your seat, if you said that and you meant that, and you want Jesus to lead your life, then Walt told you about that connection card and why it's so important. Because I want to walk with you. I'm not going to come and get you. I'm not going to drag you down in the foyer. I'm, I'm not... I want to pray for you. I want to walk with you in this journey. But I can't walk if you don't let me know. Take that connection card right now. You can grab it right now where you're sitting. And fill that out. I want to, today I began a relationship with Jesus. I may not understand all of it, but today I started. Vince, I want more information. I, I don't get all this. I, I got some questions. That's okay. That's why we're here. But you don't have to walk it alone. You don't have to do it alone. Father, I come to you this morning and I thank you. I give you thanks and praise for being God. I thank you that you love me in spite of me. The Lord, with all of my stuff, the faults and failures and insecurities and the things that I have, God, You looked down and you saw fit to give me a purpose. To give me a plan. And so, Lord, I pray that not only in my life, I thank you for that in my life, but, Lord, I pray that people in this building would see it and receive it. That they would see your plan for their life and they would trust it. That they would follow it, God. That they would get up and go when you tell them to go. And, Lord, that we would just do what we do. What we are created and wired to do by the hand of God. And, Father, I will forever and ever give you the praise. It is in Jesus' name we pray.